Time to start back. Uh, welcome uh, everyone to this next talk of the academic track of Phosphor G2021. Uh, my name is Marco Minghini uh, from Italy. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce the next uh, speaker of this session, uh, Philippe Ruffin. He holds a PhD in geography. Um, his research aims at mapping agricultural systems across large areas and long time frames to improve our understanding of food production, water resource consumption, and land management. Philippe has also several years of teaching experience in uh, applied earth observation classes using phosphor G tools. And recently, um, he and his colleagues decided to develop a QGIS plugin for facilitating the integration of Google Earth Engine and QGIS. And this is exactly what uh, he's going to uh, tell us uh, in his talk uh, titled uh, GEE Time Series Explorer for QGIS Instant Access to Petabytes of Earth Observation Data. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Marco. So, um, yeah, you already um, introduced nicely what I'm going to present today, and I have to say that I'm not a developer by training, but you know, I'm doing research and teaching. So, this presentation is the result of kind of me needing a new tool to do my research and do my teaching. But at the same time, I was lucky to meet uh, Andreas Rabe, my very um, appreciated colleague that helped me to discuss the ideas and put them into practice. So he was the developer behind this work that I'm going to present here. And also my colleagues Leon Nil and Patrick Costa were supporting this work a lot. So, um, well, if you're interested in reading more, there's a short paper in the proceedings and I put the link here on the title slide, but you can find it in the, in the proceedings and in the conference program as well. Okay. So let's see if this presentation works. So I guess everybody here is aware um, with the onset of the open data policy, there was kind of a shift in paradigm in terms of um, earth observation analysis workflows. So we have an increasing number of image archives available that, for example, MODIS, Landsat, um, the Copernicus program, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1 archives that people can access really uh, easily and free of cost. So research and earth observation kind of changed from the analysis of single images or multi-temporal um, time series analysis with a few images across maybe 15 years or so towards something that is more dense time series analysis where we really look into phenology. Um, and this really um, fertilized a lot of applications like forestry, agriculture, ecology, uh, mapping of land use or land cover change. So here, for example, we see a time series of uh, vegetation index derived from Landsat, where the dark green are uh, basically high values, meaning high vegetation activity, and the white values are basically low vegetation activities. So if we poke uh, into a single pixel of this time series, we can extract a um, kind of time series profile that shows us basically how vegetation changes over time. So we can derive from this information on crop types or land management. Very nice stuff. So I mentioned this change in paradigm and this can be nicely illustrated with the example of Landsat, where there has been um, quite a long phase where Landsat data had to be bought for varying prices. And then after 2008, the data became free and we can see with this gray bar here that there was a really sharp increase in the number of images downloaded, but also the blue curve, the number of publications that use Landsat data and the orange curve that really um, went steeply upwards um, that uses Landsat data in combination with some kind of time series analysis. So this is kind of the background um, of this talk. So um, there is an increasing number of methods and applications that want to make use of these uh, time series. But the starting point for you know, further developing research and pushing the boundaries a little bit is uh, most often explorative and it asks typically a couple of questions that are mostly uh, which data do we have, how much of it is there and you know, does the data availability really uh, meet the requirements that we have um, in order to see what we want to see in time series and use the appropriate methods. So it's a common thing to um, have to explore um, basically data before we actually want to use them or before we can make sure that our research is, is working. So exploring time series can be done in a variety of ways. Um, there are several options that also come with a couple of constraints. So for instance, we could think about exploring time series locally, but then the obvious problem is 
we have very large data volumes that kind of create constraints for accessibility because a time series of, for example, Sentinel-2 for only one tile for one year is already yeah, nearly 60 gigabytes worth of data and it becomes already hard to process on a local machine like a laptop or a workstation. If we want to expand this a little bit more uh, to an entire country, for example, Germany, we are facing four terabytes worth of data for only one year. So that's not really an option for, for most people. And of course, we have a lot of cloud-based services like Earth Engine, and they are very powerful and provide already um, very different image archives that we can access and tap. However, um, most often we are facing the hurdle of having to code a specific script or a specific application or it could be a Jupyter notebook in order to really access a time series and look into this signal that I was showing earlier, right? There were also a couple of browser-based platforms, for example, the Web Earth Observation Monitor by colleagues from the University of Jena, which was really great. Um, it was deprecated due to lack of funding. Um, but also these type of tools have the limitation that they most often um, Kind of offering access to a single archive, in this case it was the MODIS archive, and it's really difficult to integrate with external data sets. So that brings us already pretty close to um, the motivation for this talk. So um, what we wanted to do, or what I saw that there's a need for, is a tool that allows us to instantly explore a time series from Earth Observation Image Archives, and not just one, but many. Um, and those should be somewhat um, compatible with local data sources, like a vector data set of um, field data, for example. And then in many applications, it's really useful to have uh, the opportunity to download for a specific location just a time series, not an entire image, but just time series for one location. So sample-based data download. And ideally, we wanted to do this with uh, very, very low accessibility constraints in terms of the things I mentioned earlier. So not so much need for coding and everything quite accessible and wrapped in a user-friendly interface. So this should be useful to researchers, but also very much useful in uh, education in order to teach students the analysis of time series, for example. Okay, and this is already um, kind of the <laughs> The result of um, what we wanted to do, um, and uh, it's called the QGIS Time Series Explorer plugin. Um, it has a couple of panels that you can see here in the top of this QGIS interface. It has a couple of general functionalities, a graph or a plot window where you can see time series, a couple of settings you can make, as well as a point navigation. Um, this entire plugin, I want to highlight that um, specifically, is built on the Earth Engine QGIS plugin that links QGIS and Earth Engine through the Earth Engine Python API. So um, it's really cool that this plugin exists and we can, can build things on top of that. So um, in the following minutes, I want to present to you a couple of uh, video recordings that demonstrate the plugin in use. So to start, let me launch this video. Um, we enable the plugin and we can select from a list of predefined collections something that we want to dig into. So here we choose a predefined Landsat collection that features all the Landsat sensors and we added vegetation indices like EVI to this custom collection. We can create a date filter to you know, only look into a subset or a time period of interest for our analysis. So here we set 2010, January until um, the end of September, so very recently, and we activate this cursor and we can click into any location on the map, anywhere in the globe where there's lots of data available, and within a couple of seconds we retrieve this time series of EVI data. We can click to the next location, again we wait a couple of seconds, uh, and we retrieve the data and we can see the updated graph. So this uh, graph is interactive, so we can zoom on the different axes, we can pan around and scroll around as much as we want in order to really explore the time series in, in depth and in detail. Okay, then we have a point browser, so we can select um, a vector data set, like a field data set with point locations in it, and the plugin will automatically jump to the first location, and we can skip point by point to the different locations contained in the shapefile and retrieve the time series of the selected spectral bands or indices automatically. 
All right. So some users maybe want um, to access the data directly, and for this we have the function to just copy in plain text format what we see in this, in this graph panel. So we can copy paste the data directly. And for the larger data sets, there's the option to download time series for each feature in the vector data set that we selected down there. So if we have a couple of hundred points, um, a single text file will be created for each point with the same type of uh, text information that we saw before. Okay, so that was my um, use case number one. Um, the second thing I want to present is the visualization of image data um, that we can also do in this plugin. So there's also a short video starting in the same location. Um, so we can define basically like in the standard QGIS rendering options um, different ways of visualizing imagery. And here we can select from the spectral bands that are available, apply a percentile stretch, and the plugin will retrieve. Um, after activating this image functionality, a WMS layer from Earth Engine that is being visualized um, pretty straightforward in the map canvas. So we can explore the images and we have the chance to navigate through time, navigate backwards in time with these arrow buttons up there to the previous image and one image further backwards in time to really go through the time series um, also visually in terms of images. But you can also navigate directly in the graph and click anywhere in your time series profile wherever you think there's something interesting. Okay. Um, you have the chance to store these layers in the layer list. Um, there's a small button to do exactly that. So this layer that we see now will be retained and we can jump to another observation and store the same image. Um, which allows us then to flicker back and forth and really directly compare without having to wait for loading times and so on. Um, the next nice feature, which is my favorite feature really in this plugin, is the temporal binning. So what we can do here is um, determine um, a temporal window that we think is suitable to aggregate all the observations that we have. So we can say we want to um, create, for example, a mean value across 60 days um, of time series that we have calculate the reflectance for these different bands um, in the given time range and visualize this as an image. So here we are selecting a median image for a two-month period in the year 2015. We wait a couple of seconds and again this will be retrieved as a WMS layer and will be visualized. So maybe now you're interested in jumping through the time series, seeing the exact same time interval in every year, jumping back and forth. There's also a function to do that. So we can define an, a temporal increment that allows you to jump a predefined amount of time forward or backward in time. So now we can jump to the next year like this and the next year again. Okay. Okay, um, so we have a couple of predefined collections, as I mentioned, so most of them are the standard collections, like you would see them also in Earth Engine, but there are these more interesting, a bit more customized collections. For example, the Landsat collection that includes cloud masking, integrates the different sensors, and then also adds vegetation index layers or other type of uh, spectral features to the collection that you can then directly visualize. Um, with our collection editor, you have the chance to modify these collections directly in QGIS. It means you see the Python code for the specific collection, you see the functions that are being defined there, and there's also a description contained in those, um, which you can then directly modify, reload the collection, and see how the changes apply. So you might be interested in creating your own custom collections, which you can then to add to the directory of the plugin and have available in the list of predefined collections. And we would also like to highlight that this is a um, somewhat of a community effort, so we would invite you in case you have a co custom collection that is really useful for the community and we didn't include it yet, um, to contribute via Bitbucket um, your collection. Um, have us 
taking a look at it and inviting you to, to join the team and really um, contribute to this plugin. So that would be cool. I think there are people in the audience also who did that already. So um, by now, since the release of this plugin, we have uh, two new collections, uh, which is the Era 5, Era 5 Daily Climate Collection, as well as two um, Sentinel 1 collections that we didn't include previously. So thanks to you guys if you can hear this talk. Um, the plugin is quite efficiently, so you saw this in the video now. This was recorded at my home, so it's not a crazy fast internet connection. Um, we implemented a parallel downloading capability when we want to download samples that accelerate things really much. And the WMS technology is used for image visualization and it kind of resembles the speed um, as if you would use the uh, Google Earth Engine uh, browser-based uh, visualization, basically. So we did a couple of performance tests and if we, um, for example, download 35 years worth of CloudMask Landsat time series, for 1,000 locations distributed across the globe, this takes on average four minutes and two seconds. So it's a price really, um, it is really affordable in case you want to, for example, investigate the use of time series in your modeling framework or for your classification approaches. And then we have a couple of visualization tests. So a cloud mask Landsat image takes on average five seconds to show up. Um, we calculate a monthly mean reflectance across Germany, this is 17 seconds. And if you go larger scale, continental scale, you have wait times of 47 seconds in this case for Europe, or sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on what you actually, uh, what you actually do. But I think this is a kind of benchmark value to look at. So I can demonstrate this also again using um, a video. So here we define. Uh, one of those temporal bins of two months again. Um, have a couple of presets in terms of the band rendering. And then we activate this um, image functionality. Load an image. We can see that uh, one image frame is being loaded in the settings that we wanted to. So that's commonly the image that is overlapping with the time series location that we loaded previously. But we can extend. So we enable this function that is called show full map canvas extend. And uh, this will trigger a request to Earth Engine asking for basically the entire extent of the map canvas that you can see. And the WMS will be retrieved um, to, for example, look into monthly, bi monthly um, percentile reflectance across half of the Amazon biome in a couple of seconds. So I really like this. And we can zoom in. So this WMS layer is reactive, we can zoom in further and the special resolution will update and we we'll see uh, with sufficient detail the processes that we want to that we want to highlight here. So then again we can store this layer, jump 10 years forward in time, store the same layer and flicker back and forth in order to really assess uh, land cover changes pretty pretty instantly. Like this. So that's, I think, from the demonstration side, is everything. Um, if you're interested in using this plugin, we have a Read the Docs page with the documentation on how to install it and how to use it. Um, with a new version, it should be a little bit easier uh, as compared to before. And um, yeah, I'm happy if you liked this talk. I um, want to thank you for your attention and uh, hope you can check out the Read the Docs. If you have any issues or comments, you can either leave us a note or an issue on Bitbucket or contact us by email or Twitter. Okay, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry.
I realized I was muted. I, I think oh. I'm not sure you hear you. You heard me. So uh, I was thanking you for the presentation and for the impressive work. And uh, uh, I was saying that the audience uh, uh, was also impressed as I as I've seen a lot of applause is coming uh, while you were speaking. We have questions. Uh, the first one uh, is is a simple one. It came while you were showing the first video, and the question is: Can we also select areas? I realized I was muted. I, I think I'm not sure you hear you. You heard me. So uh, I was thanking you for the presentation and for the impressive work. And okay, sorry. So if we can select areas uh, for extracting the time series, that's not yet possible. So I guess the question targets the um, aggregation of areas to extract kind of an average profile. So um, we can't do this yet. It's a nice comment, though. Thanks. And we have another interesting question. How to initialize a Google Earth Engine in QGIS? So do we need to add a Gmail account and credentials in QGIS as well? So how does the connection happen? So the connection happens uh, through the Earth Engine for QGIS plugin that I was mentioning earlier. So the entire authorization is being done in the background before you firstly can use this plugin. And it works. Um, I think in the most recent version of the plugin, it works uh, through the uh, Python console directly in QGIS, which then launches a browser window. You log in into your Gmail or your Google account, retrieve an API key, which you then pass into the console. Um, this should be working right now. So the authorization can be done directly from QGIS. Thanks a lot. This is very important to know. Uh, I invite the audience to uh, still ask questions, of course, while we go through the ones already uh, there. Um, there are two additional questions. I, I can merge them into a single one, and it's about uh, the data and the data catalog. So how uh, does the plugin update itself? So is it updating at the same time as the data sets uh, are updating in Google Earth Engine? Does the plugin include all the catalogs of Google Earth Engine? Um, not yet. So um, we did not include the entire catalog because some of the collections aren't really um, kind of suitable with this kind of concept that we're using. So this time information is crucial, and for now we are staying in the um, you know with the highest detail in the daily temporal resolution. But I know there are also collections that feature, for example, hourly data that we. Um, for instance, the climate data sets that are available there. So what we have here is really a predefined set of collections that are defined as small Python scripts in the repository, in the folder of the plugin. And you can change those, you can amend them and add more if you want. But we have a, a kind of a limited set that features mostly modus collections, Lancet collections, um, the Sentinel-2 collections, now Sentinel-1 and ERA-5 daily climate, thanks to the um, community um, contributions. But um, this list is really um, up for expansion, if you wish. Thanks a lot, Philippe, for the answer. I, I don't see additional questions. So while waiting for new ones, I can maybe ask one uh, myself. And it's about the, uh, the, the software uh, project itself. So um, you said that you started to develop this with your team, basically. But uh, um, given that this probably is uh, interesting for a, a huge uh, amount of users uh, in general, I just want to know what is the status, what is the maturity of the project? I mean, is it still on you and your team? Uh, were you able to create a community around the software? Uh, what are the future developments that you uh, foresee at the moment? Uh, are you discussing this with the community or is it still a, more, a local project? Um, so far, it's quite local because we haven't really presented this to the community. I mean, the response was um, quite positive from, from our networks, basically, but we haven't really put this out there. And now it's the time to do it, um, so I'm happy to receive any type of feedback. So far, as principally, this is kind of a, it's really kind of a um, community effort that, you know, there's no real funding for this, so we're doing this in our spare time. But also, um, my colleague Andreas Rabe, he has been developing a couple of plugins that are really nice to use, um, specifically for the work with raster data sets that are worth checking out. And he has also a personal motivation to, to kind of amend this um, list of plugins that he's using. And for the future developments, um, the idea was to, to um, think this a bit further in, in terms of the download capabilities and not only um, consider downloading sample-based data, but also think about re-downloading image chips 
um, which then can be used uh, locally for for further you know investigation of time series. For example, downloading a stack of images that we can directly put to disk and investigate in QJS from from your local hard drive. So that's um, some of the things that we envision. Yeah, uh, in, indeed, I think this was the right moment, uh, given that the work uh, looks uh, mature. So thanks a lot again for presenting it at the Phosphor G and uh, uh, for the for the audience, please take note of the links that we see now uh, in the in the slide. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, in the documentation or uh, in using the software or clearly in opening issues, here are all the links and feel free to contact uh, Philip. I'm sure he will be happy to share with you more uh, about this work. Um, we have an additional uh, question that is about uh, one of the previous questions. Um, the, um, uh, the person asking says, I don't think this was answered. Is the plugin updating at the same time as the data sets are updating in Google Earth Engine? Maybe you want to elaborate more on this, Philip. So the updating, you mean the data catalog that is updating? So is this the question, or are you talking about something else? Yeah, this is my my understanding. So whether the when the data sets uh, are uh, updated in Google Earth Engine, if what you find in QGIS is automatically updated or, or not. I think this is the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's automatically updated because every time you launch the plugin, there's a new authorization and everything. All the requests are sent to Earth Engine, and you know. Um, tapping the, the collections and the image archives that are there at the moment. So there's no versioning or anything. It's always the most recent version of the data sets and all the collections that are available at the moment are also available through the plugin. Okay, thanks a lot, Philippe, for the, for the clarification. Uh, we should close uh, the talk now, but uh, once again, I invite the audience to get in touch with Philippe. Uh, there is also a paper published in the academic track uh, proceedings of Post4G 2021. I invite you all to have a look if you are interested and to contact Philippe for any further um, uh, information you may need. Uh, thanks also to the audience for the questions and for the input. And if you like the talk, please let Philippe know uh, with, a, with a virtual applause. Uh, thanks again, uh, um, and uh, uh, see you in the next talk, and I wish you a good uh, continuation of Postgre 2021. Thank you.